Terry Killian. I am a co-spokesperson for Citizens for a Clean Wassa. What a way to start our day today. I am so excited and I am so proud to present to you Mr. Stephen Lester. Stephen has toxicology and environmental health degrees from Harvard and NYU, respectively. He's the science director for the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice. At the height of the disaster, Stephen served as the toxicologist at the Love Canal in New York. This was one of the worst environmental disasters in the history of our country. He also recently and continues to be a part of the expert panel at East Palestine, Ohio. That is the um, location where the catastrophic train derailment took place, about which we've all heard so much of on the national news. Also, in past years, and at the request of local residents, Stephen reviewed environmental data from Wausau's southwest side and provided his conclusions. We were grateful for his experience and his expertise and his willingness to assist us. Please give Stephen a warm, warm welcome to let him know how excited and appreciative we are to have him address us and provide much needed education regarding environmental health issues. Stephen Lester. Good morning, time. everybody. Um, it's, it's, thank you, Terry, for that introduction. And um, it's really a, a, a pleasure and an honor for me to be here. I mean, uh, Citizens for Clean Wasar are one of my favorite groups. Uh, you know, we, we work with groups all over the country, and um, I have a few favorites, and this group is one. Um, before I begin, I just tell you a little bit about what my plan is for my presentation, and I'm going to share with you some stories from my time at Love Canal, and I think that's valuable because that shaped my understanding of how science is used in community settings. So I'll tell you a few stories, tell you about some of what I've learned, and then uh, uh, if there's time, we can have a Q&A. So I want to begin by talking about the organization that I work for. Let's see here. Right. I know there's a way to do this. What I'm seeing, let's see. Is that it? All right. Okay, got it. All right, so Center for Health, Environment, and Justice. Uh, I'm the science director there. I've been there since we were started in 19... I, I've been there since 1981 when we uh, were founded by Lois Gibbs, who's the resident leader from the Love Canal. We're based in Falls Church, Virginia, and we provide organizing and technical assistance to grassroots community groups around the country. Uh, a few years ago, in 2017, we actually merged with another organization called the People's uh, People's Action Institute. So we are actually a project of them now. We're not a separate organization. So uh, what I do with, with CHEJ is the science. I provide, uh, I work with groups, I evaluate technical information of all kind. This includes engineering reports, health studies, environmental test results of all kind, and I help people understand what it says and just as importantly what it doesn't say. And the second half of my job, which I find just as important, is to help people understand how the science fits into their local organizing work. So it's not just about the information, it's about the science, what you do with it. So um, I got my start in this work at um, a place that, meant, that, that Terry mentioned called Love Canal. And, um, what I, my job there was to work with the community, I was hired by the state of New York to be a technical advisor to the residents of Love Canal. And so, uh, and so that's what I did. Um, I 
I would like to tell you a little bit about Love Canal. I, I don't want to presume that everybody here knows what that is and why it became such a national and, and notorious website, uh, dump site. So um, Love Canal is an old landfill outside on the edge of Niagara Falls. And it came about because of an entrepreneur named William Love, who had this idea to connect the upper and lower Niagara rivers and build a model city between those two areas, about a 10 mile stretch. And it, his idea was a great one, except they discovered how to, uh, al how to, how to transmit electricity alternately. And so when that came about, then you no longer had to be located right where the energy was generated. So what was left when he lost all his investors was a quarter mile stretch of an actual canal, hence the name, um, along the southern edge of the Niagara River. And um, what happened is Hooker Chemical, a uh, local com chemical company, and you can't imagine how many chemical companies are in Niagara Falls. It's, it's an enormous uh, industrial area. And um, they bought it in the 1940s and started damming off the canal and filling it with chemicals. And they ended up putting 20,000 tons of toxic waste in this landfill. Covered it over and walked away. And people began to build homes around the back of this. I mean, in the image there on the, on the slide, you can see that uh, that center area is the old landfill. And those are homes that are built on either side of it. And in 1953, a school was built on top of the landfill. That's the school kind of under the love word. Uh, that's the 99th Street School. And that's been, that was built on top of the landfill. And um, that was the spark that, that kind of triggered a lot of the activities. And so, um, so I got asked to come there to, to, as I mentioned, to be the science advisor by the state of New York. And I, I'll tell you, I want to tell you a few stories from my time there. Uh, uh, and I want to start with the, the first day I went to Love Canal and the day I met Lois Gibbs, who was the local leader and our founding director for 40 years at CHEJ. And um, so I was invited to come to Love Canal to review the safety plan for the cleanup by the attorney who was working with Lois and the residents at the time. And so he picked, me, he picked me up at the airport and drove, we drove from Buffalo to Niagara Falls, about a half hour drive, and he never bothered to tell me what was happening that day. That day, which is October 10th in 1978, was D-Day. That's what the residents call this. D-Day was the day they were going to begin construction, digging into the landfill, and there was a question about what they might find because they was concerns that military, military waste had been buried in the landfill and that they might, the, the backhoe as it goes in, might hit a, a, a barrel or a tanker or something and cause an explosion. So throughout the neighborhood on this day, there were buses stationed, running, ready to evacuate people in the event of a, a release of toxic gas into the neighborhood. So that's the setting for when I arrived. And I didn't have any idea that that was the background, that that was going on. So when I arrived there, uh, there were all of these media everywhere. And of course, I'm the so-called expert from Washington, D.C. coming in. And as I got out of the car, I was besieged with all of these media cameras and microphones. And, and the, the, they said to me, uh, what are you going to do for the residents of Love Canal? And, and meanwhile, I'm just cursing this lawyer guy for not saying anything to me about this. Let me walk into this. But um, I just simply said, I have nothing to say until I talk to the residents. And so I walked uh, past the, cr the crowd of the media into the school, which is where the home base for every all the activities was at that school, which had, at this point had been abandoned. And, uh, the, and, and so, uh, and that's when I met Lois. And the first thing Lois said to me as I, we sat down is she says, you can't trust the state of New York. They don't give us information. They're lying to us constantly. It's just nothing but trouble. And I said, okay. And then I met the state health department people a few minutes after that, and they said, where did you get to meet this woman, Gibbs? You can't believe what she says. She makes things up. She's always lying to us, and, and she's uncontrollable, and you, 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 know, you can't trust her. And I said, wow, this is what I'm getting myself into. And so it, it's, it's, it's a crazy situation. It was. Um, I've, uh, uh, Terry mentioned that I'm now working with the folks in East Palestine and Ohio after that horrific train wreck. And, and that situation is the only other situation I've been involved in that can compare to what's happened and what I experienced at Love Canal. 
But just a few more images here from Love Canal. Um, you can see the, the homes, how close they were. There were, there were 900 homes built around that landfill. This is just another uh, uh, aerial view of the area. That area between the homes is the landfill. You can see how scarred it is and, and uh, how crazy it is. And, and what happened, what brought this all to head was that a huge snowstorm in the summer, in the winter of 1976-77, where in Buffalo they had like 80 inches of snow. It was not a climate-related storm. It was just kind of what happens sometimes in that area. And, and in that spring, after the, um, as the snow began to melt, the groundwater table just rose. And all these, and up with the groundwater came the chemicals that were buried in the landfill. And on that surface, some of that area is in that center where it's so whitish, that's where the chemicals came up. And the, the chemicals also came up into the homes of the people who lived there, whose homes backed onto this property. So it was, it was a pretty nasty situation. Uh, when, that day I arrived, this chemical odor in the air was just unbelievable. And when I said to Lois, what's up with this odor? She said, what odor? And that's when, that was one of my first lessons in understanding how people adapt to these kind of things. This is just a home. I mean, it was a nice suburban neighborhood. It was a great place to grow, grow up and, and rear your kids. And uh, on the upper, and th these are just some images of some of the, 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 the soil there to the right, that darker picture. That's a, sur a, so a hole that, where the chemicals surfaced and it's just black goop. You know, you, you'd, you'd have a hard time pushing it with a stick because it's so thick. It's all chemicals. And you see that a little bit there. That's where it's one of those holes have dried up. The bottom picture is somebody's basement with the chemicals seeping through their basement walls. So, and, and, and the levels of chemicals in the basements of these homes built next to the canal were higher than occupational standards. And, and the residents of Love Canal, were, if nothing else, were engaged. They came out, they did everything. They had rallies, they had protests. The bottom left corner is a, a full paid ad, the ad they put in the paper to counter a full, paid ad, full page ad by Occidental Petroleum, which said, you know, these, ask, ask the people who know. That's what Oxy's ad said. This one says, ask the people who really know. And so they just did, they just did stuff. They had signs, they were involved, they were everywhere another sign from the area. All right, so um, one of the very first things I learned at Love Canal was the value and, uh, of lo uh, local community knowledge. Nobody knows a community and a situation better than the people who live there. And so that's one of the lessons I took away from because people really understood what was going on. As an outside expert, you have to listen to the people because they know what's happening. You can't help people unless you understand what they're experiencing. And, and, and people like Lois, Lois was asking me for my toxicology books, for my college books, because she just couldn't get enough. She had to know. So the role of science in these situations. Um, I want to be really clear that science is critically important. You can't be successful without understanding and taking on the science. But the science itself is not sufficient. There's not enough. There's so much uncertainty, and I'll speak to a lot of that in the next little bit. So you need it. You need it for the basis of your arguments to educate not just your community, but people outside of the community, because you need their support to be effective. And there are differences between opinions and facts. And again, I'll speak to that in a little bit. So we used to do a lot of training. And the trainings always had two camps, sort of two tracks. One was the organizing track and the other science track. And before the training started, we would always have a questionnaire to ask people to help pe people sort which track they should go to. And this is always my favorite science question. And the question, as you see on the board here, says, is information power true or false? And we'd ask people to raise their hands. And you could do the same. You think, is it true? Is information power? If you think so, raise your hands. OK. So all of you folks should come to the science track, because you're going to learn that that's not the case. It's not that information is power. It's what you do with that information is what gives you power. So having the best information or a terrific report on the problems in your community by itself doesn't do anything. It won't change anything. But if you have a plan for what you're going to do with it and how you're going to use it and how you're going to educate people and how you're going to, it's going to help you achieve what your goals are, then you've got something. So, in our work, um, we get people contacting us all the time asking for information for the same reason. They're kind of feeling that if I just got the right information in the hands of the right people, they would do the right thing. I so wish that were true. 
but it is not, unfortunately. And so um, everybody starts out thinking that, that, that government's going to take care of them, that government will do the right thing. They just don't have the right information, or they just don't know what's right. And, and, and it, you'll, I'm going to give you some reasons why that doesn't happen, some examples of why that doesn't happen. Why, the reasons why I, I really can't speak to that well, because I'm not there. I'm not part of that. So, um, and even in East Palestine, where I am now, I, 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 the, the situation's no different. People there initially believe that the government's going to take care of them. The government's going to come in and do the right thing. They'll do the right testing. And it just hasn't happened there, and it didn't happen at Love Canal, and it happens in very few communities that I've worked with in, in over 40 years. And this is one of the hardest lessons for people to learn and to accept, that government isn't going to help them. But it, it, it just, it, and, and it's not that people in government are bad. It's not that there's some plan that they don't want to do these things. It's just that the, the information, the science, isn't there to justify the, the decisions and the things they want to do. So, um, and, and then you have these other uncertainties where the science isn't there, and then you have issues of uh, cost, who's going to pay for it? If it's cleanup, who's going to pay for it? If it's relocation, who's going to pay for it? Liability issues come up, you have, you know, people get sick, or if you acknowledge that the people have gotten sick, people want to sue. They want to get to the lawyers and go after these companies. And then you have the issue of setting a precedent. If you do this for this community, you'll have to do it for other communities that are facing similar situations. So there's all of these factors that come into play. So, but it doesn't work for your, it doesn't work out for the people in the communities. And I've got a couple of more stories I want to tell you from Love Canal. Um, I mentioned that I was hired by the state of New York to be this advisor. Um, they were happy to hire me. It was the second thing the residents had a list of demands. The first thing is they wanted out. The second thing is they wanted a scientist of their choosing. So uh, the state was happy to hire me because they saw me as a buffer between the community and them. So they would be happy to work with me, a so-called professional who, who is not, who, you know, who will sit and be, be proper and that kind of thing in meetings, something that they had already experienced with Lois and the residents was not the, the situation. So, um, so my first job, if you will, when I got on the site was, uh, um, oh, actually, I had two jobs. One was to help people with the science, and the second was to be on site during the cleanup. I was the eyes, ears, and nose of the residents. No, pe no community residents were allowed on the site during the cleanup, but I was. So I was there every, every day that I was on site, and I would report to the residents and share what was going on. So, but uh, on the other side, the residents had already gone door to door, gathered health information, about what was going on in their communities and they were putting that together, they were analyzing it. And they were already working with a scientist from Roswell Park, who uh, a, a local research place, and so she and I worked together to take these, 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 this data and Lois had put them all on what they call measles maps, you know, she put all the, you know, they gathered information on birth defects, they had some powerful information on birth defects that had been occurring in the neighborhood, on reproductive outcomes in general, on um, uh, central nervous system problem, liver disease. Uh, they had all this information, they put them on maps, and you could see clusters of these diseases occurring in different parts of the neighborhood. That turned out to be really critical later when it was discovered that there were underground pathways that connected the canal to these areas and so that you had an ev evidence for how the, uh, the contamination was seeping out. So anyway, we took this data, Beverly and I, the other scientists, to Albany to a meeting with the state health department people to share what we had found. And uh, we had what we thought was a great meeting. Uh, they listened to us, they took our concerns very seriously, they, we, we shared everything we had, and we walked away from that meeting thinking that this was really a good day and they were really gonna do something about what we had brought to them and that this was a, really a step forward. Well, we got on the airplane, we flew, flew back to Buffalo from Albany, and in those days, you had evening papers as well as just papers. And the evening, Buffalo Evening News, front page headline that we saw at the airport in three inch block letters with these huge words, three words that said, useless housewife data. That's what the state of New York told the press about our meeting. And of course, we were shocked. We couldn't believe that this is what the paper was reporting about our meeting. And so Beverly, angry and the kind of fighter that she was, got onto the phone immediately while we were still at the airport and talked to the person who had run the meeting and said, what, what is this about? 
and, 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 and she realized, and she didn't get any answers as to what it was about. But it was clear that something else had happened, somebody else had gotten involved. We later found out that that press release was released just about an hour after we got to Albany. So even though we'd spent almost the entire day there, they, they had already predisposed what they were gonna say. So that was, enough, that was a lesson. And then, uh, and I found out, it took me about a six, another couple of weeks after this meeting to better understand what was going on. And um, I wanna show you a picture because Oh, all right. I, I skipped over this part, so I have to I have to talk about that before I get to the picture. All right. So, um, so, all right. Let me see. Where am I here? Okay. All right. So um, now we're moving way too fast. Okay, that's the picture I wanted to show. But before I get to the picture, I have to talk a little bit about the limits of science. Um, because, um, all right, let me just go to the picture. Let me do that and then I'll come back to the limits of science. So this picture is the picture of a typical meeting at Love Canal. 500 people packed in an auditorium at the school, everything was happening at the school, and raw emotions everywhere. People crying, people screaming, people yelling. I mean, it was crazy what was going on at Love Canal, and, and, and I've not, not since, only East Palestine is any place that's even close, and it's nothing like even Love Canal. Uh, so there were a lot of emotions there, and after one of these meetings, um, you know, I went to Lois's house after the meeting, because Lois was really good. After every meeting she was involved in, the leadership of the group got together to talk about the meeting afterwards. They did this before the meeting, did it after the meeting. And she didn't do this because she knew that was the right thing to do from an organizing context. She did it because she just knew instinctively that was the right thing to do. So we talked about what was good, what went well at the meeting, what didn't, what could, it, what could we do differently, that kind of thing. And so, um, so after I left that after her house after a little bit and went back to the hotel where I was staying. And there's only one hotel in that end of Niagara Falls. And so um, I went to my room and you know there was a TV and you know I, I was too wired to just sit and watch TV or something so I went downstairs to the bar and get a, to get a drink and so there in the bar already there were all the health department people who were run the meeting and since I was working for them they thought I was a friend and so they invited me to join them which I did and I sat down and what I heard over the next five or ten minutes just absolutely was a, a, a eye-opener for me because the second in command for the health department, the deputy commissioner of health was, who ran the meeting, the public meeting, was sitting at the head of the table and all he was doing was bragging about how he had handled himself and handled the meeting. How he had not given information to the resident, how he had not shared uh, what they already knew and, and how when that, that, that woman with, with a B that matches, starts with a matches which Gibbs asked questions, how he didn't answer her questions, how he avoided answering her question. And I'm sitting here thinking, oh my God, I, you know, I, I'm seven, six, seven months out of an Ivy League's education thinking I understood what science was about. I, was, I thought I understood that science was about sort of the seek for truth and sharing information, and yet here's the Deputy Commissioner of Health for a major state, New York. It's not like some small country state that doesn't have uh, the best of the best and the brightest. It was New York State, and he was bragging about the way he handled himself in a meeting. This is when the light bulb went on for me that something else is going on. It's not about Infor getting information in the hands of people. It's not about helping people understand what's known or what's not. It's about control. It's about control. And reassuring people that everything is all right, no matter what's going on. And, and, and I can't tell you that's exact, I hate to tell you that it's exactly what's happening in East Palestine. In that situation, EPA is just already dis predetermined what's gonna, what they're gonna say, and everything they do is just, you know, no matter, even no matter what they find, they're just, backing that they, they keep to their party line. It's all about management. So that, at that moment in time, that's when I realized that that's what this was about. These public health agencies were all about reassuring the public that everything was fine. And for 40 plus years, I've seen it play out over and over and over again. That's not unique to Love Canal. 
And as I mentioned, it's going on in East Palestine right now. And so I said to myself, why? Why is this happening? Why would the State Health Department behave this way? And I realized, after a little bit of thinking and a lot of thinking afterwards, actually, was that the reason that is because if they tell the truth, if they told the people what they knew and what they didn't know and how little they really understood about the science of what's going on in these communities, people will say, well, you have to do something. That's where the concept of truth and consequences come from. They tell the truth. There are consequences. And the consequences are that they have to act to protect the people because that's what people will demand. But if they don't tell the truth, if they tell these lies and this misinformation and do things that just support a narrative and not the truth, then they don't have to ever go there. And that's one of the most important lessons that I have learned that I want to share with you all. And, and, and so uh, now, you know, I mentioned that, you know, why, do, why does this happen? And it, it happens in part because of the limitations in the science. What we don't know. Okay. I'll get this right. I got two screens in front of me, and one says one thing, and the other says something else. Here we go. The limitations. That's what you're seeing, right? Yeah. So it, it, it's all about what we don't know in the science end. You know, every politician, every government agency person turns to their scientists and asks the question, all right, what's the situation here? What do we know? What can I say? What can I justify saying? What can I do? And, the science, and so they're turning and looking to the sciences, asking for answers, and they can't get facts. They can only get opinion. But it's not couched as opinion. It's couched as facts. This is the situation. And, and that's, 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 what's, that's one of the places where this, this whole scenario falls apart. So in fact, there are a few answers to the questions about toxic chemical exposures. Scientists actually know very little about what levels of exposure can lead to, act to health problems in communities. We know a great deal about a lot of chemicals like lead and dioxin and benzene and you know, other, you know, a whole host of others. But when it comes down to actually pinpointing whether a specific exposure will re lead to a specific health outcome, we don't know how to answer that question. And the we is the science community. It's not me, it's not the head of this department or that department. It's the scientific. We can't answer those questions. And very little is known about what level of the contaminants in your body will lead to health, pro health outcomes. So there's just so much we don't, we, we, we don't know. So, um, so when the government, so when government officials turn to the scientists and they get these answers, it's like, it just doesn't work. Um, and so, so I, uh, let me go to another story from Love Canal, and this kind of speaks to some of this, uh, all this uncertainty. I mean, this uncertainty has been used by the industry, chemical industry, and their, uh, the, and their uh, pay for hire scientists to create doubt and defeat that doubt, deceive that doubt, and to, to create a situation where until we know we shouldn't and can't act. And that just is not tenable for communities because it gets them nowhere because they're continuing to live with their exposures. But at Love Canal, uh, every person got a piece of paper uh, with test results of what the chemicals they found in their homes. They did seven indicator compounds in. And part of what I had to do was go to sit down with folks, you know, one-on-one -on -one pretty much at the public meetings, but most of the times it was one-on-one -on -one and people said, okay, here's my results, what does it mean? And so in one situation, a woman had uh, benzene in her home, and she had a little boy, and she was really worried about whether he might get leukemia because she knew benzene causes cancer and causes leukemia. So she asked me that question, is my son going to get leukemia? And I had to look at her and tell her, feeling very frustrated, but after, I had to say, I don't know. I said, and she said, well, and this is what made this comment worth repeating. She said, how can we be smart enough to take a man from here and put him on the moon and then bring him home. But you tell me you can't tell if the science community doesn't know what's going to happen to us when we're exposed to these chemicals. And she was right. We can't, we couldn't in 1978 and we can't in 2023. To me as a scientist, that's the biggest disappointment. That in all this time we haven't done the work. The science community hasn't done the work to try to understand this. 
we still don't understand and know very much about low-level chemical exposures, especially to mixtures. And so, um, so, so in, and, and as far as what we know and what we don't know about this, think about the fact that there's only two chemicals that we can say for certain that if you have this health problem and you were exposed to that chemical, that the two are related. Two chemicals and two health outcomes. It's vinyl chloride with angiosarcoma of the liver, a very rare liver cancer. So if you have that cancer and you worked in a vinyl chloride factory, we know with certainty that that's what caused your liver cancer. Similarly with asbestos, causes a rare lining of the outside part, portion of the lung called mesothelioma. If you have that disease and you worked on brake liners or in the shipping industry, we know that that's caused that your cancer. But for nothing else can we say with certainty. Even with lead, which we know so much about, if you have a child that's been exposed to lead in their drinking water or because they ate it through you know, picot, picot feeding, that, that you still can't say for certain that if they have reduced IQs that that's what caused it. You can feel pretty good about it. You can talk about probabilities and risks. And that's what I had to do with that woman in Love Canal. I could talk to her about probabilities and risks, but I couldn't say with certainty that what was going to happen. And so where does that leave us with all this uncertainty and with industry creating the kind of doubt that it does to stop industry from going, from any action from happening? Um, we're left with this big problem and I've written up this problem here. And, and, and what it says here, is, wait a minute, is that the right one? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so what we don't have are the scientific methods that we need to evaluate at the community level what, what's hap what will happen to people exposed to toxic chemicals. We just don't know fundamentally what's going to happen to people who are exposed to mixtures of low levels of chemicals. We just don't know. And that's the reality of our situation. So after years of dealing with this, we decided to address the situation and try to think outside the box. Because we realized that the way we do this today just doesn't work. And so we came up with something that um, we called it unequal protection and unequal response. And, it's, and, it's, and the goal of this program is to develop a new model, a new federal model for evaluating health ex chemical exposures in communities and, and how communities can be protected from these exposures. And there are a couple of key elements of this community-driven response. And we, what we did is we brought together a group of about 25 community activists from around the country. We brought a group of about 15, 10 to 15 scientists who were involved in environmental health uh, toxicology, and, and we, we spent about a year developing a process. And out of that came two key points and elements. One is that we need to find a way to identify potential chemical hazards, and we wanted to use a new approach, a different approach called presumptive assumption. Presum pre 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 presumptive assumption approach. And then we, and the second step of this process is we empower, we wanted to empower people to make these decisions themselves uh, using something that we call, for lack of a better name, a community leadership team, which included all the people in the town that would be impacted by this, from government to the companies to the people. Uh, and they would make decisions based on the outcome of the presumptive asso asso association approach. So, um, I know I'm not going to spend time talking about the community outreach element of that and the community involvement element of that. All of that's on our website and you can gather that if you're interested. But I do want to talk about the presumptive association approach because that's new. That's exciting. That's a change in how we think about chemicals. It's no longer we need to have cause and effect in our world, the way we see it. We can use this approach. And there are a couple of elements of it that give me hope that we can get success with this approach. It's a scientifically based, number one. And number two, it uses, it, it was adopted by the federal government for a lot of compensation programs for the military. And what they did for these, in these programs is say, because of the lack of information, because of incomplete and missing scientific information, we can, instead of relying on cause and effect, we can make a number of presumptives and use this presumptive approach to address these questions. And, and, it's, and, it's, and we can thank our brothers and sisters uh, from the Vietnam Vets Associations because they really pioneered this around Agent Orange. 
But it's not just in Agent Orange where it's been used. It's been used in Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. It's been used for the Gulf War wet, veterans. It's been used for the burn pit veterans, uh, atomic, uh, vic, atomic testing veterans, uh, and 9-11 first responders. They all use the same approach because the science is incomplete and unable to answer those questions. Well, when we went through this, it occurred to me, well, that's the experience of every community I've worked with in over 40 years. We never know. We never have enough information. It's always incomplete. So why can't we take that approach that's been used for our military veterans and use it to affect communities? Communities who, through no fault of their own, have been exposed to toxic chemicals. This isn't something anybody did to themselves, so to speak. So we figured this is, this is something that we can do. So let me tell you how it worked for the Agent Orange, because this is exactly how we were proposing to make this work. In the case of Agent Orange, veterans had all kinds of health problems, but they, every time they went to the VA or to anybody to talk about these problems, they kept saying, well, you have to prove you were exposed, and we don't know that your health problem was caused by your exposure. So like two enormous hurdles. And, and, and so what, but they changed that. They, they recognized that, okay, we can't live with that any longer. It, we have to take care of these, these soldiers. So they said, we'll make assumption number one. Two assumptions are made. Number one is, in the case of Agent Orange, if you were in Vietnam during the spraying of Agent Orange, then you were considered exposed. You no longer would have to prove that you were actually exposed. Second, they said, they, they, they commissioned a, a special expert panel of the National Academy of Sciences, Institute of Medicine, actually, and they looked at all the evidence of dioxin and its health effects in people, and they made a list of those health problems for which there's sufficient evidence to link exposure of dioxin to the, these health outcomes. A couple of examples are prostate cancer and diabetes. So if you were a veteran of Vietnam and you were in Vietnam during spraying and you had any of those problems on that list, if you had prostate cancer, then you could get compensation from the VA. No longer would you have to prove that you were in Vietnam. No longer would you have to prove that your health problems were caused by Agent Orange. Those presumptions were made, and that's the presumption approach. And so we said, we should adopt this approach. Why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't this approach be applied to communities? And so the two key elements in the presumptive approach that we talked about was identify the chemicals that people are exposed to in the communities, and then people don't have to prove they've been exposed to these. That's presumption number one. Establish an independent expert panel that would do the same thing the committee did at Agent Orange. Look at all the data. Identify those health problems that, that people uh, Excuse me. Identify those health problems that are associated with exposure to that chemical. And if people have that, then they no longer have to prove that that health problem was caused by their exposures. And, um, and that's the second presumption. So that's, that's what that slide says. So, and then once you have a list of these health problems that are associated with that exposure, then the community leadership team, the people that's been empowered, the team that's been empowered to make decisions, can make decisions about what to do. They can decide what appropriate action to take and do it. And they would have the power to do it, not just make recommendations. They could get health care for people if that's what they needed. They can do relocation if that's what's needed, do cleanup, address the original source of the pollution. These are all potentially in play. All right, let me just wrap up with a few um, key learnings. And, um, <clears throat> and that is that science is critical, but not sufficient. Um, alone, it will not solve your problems. But combining science with advocacy is the game changer. That's what makes the difference when you come up with a plan for how you're going to use scientific information to achieve your goals. There are a few answers to the questions of what happens to people exposed to low-level chemical exposures. And the public health's primary responsibility, public health officials' primary responsibility is to maintain control and reassure the public and not to provide information and to help the public. And that's where the consequences of truth and consequences come in. And so looking forward, we need to acknowledge that the best scientific methods can't answer the questions that people are asking about health, chem exposure to chemicals in communities. They can't answer those questions. The tools that we have just can't do it. And we need to acknowledge the limits of what these tools can do, look for new tools, and our proposal is to use this presumptive association tool going forward. And with that in hand, communities will have more ability and hopefully the power to make changes in their community. Thank you very much. <laughs>